join our event, please wait a moment while the other guests are joining our rooms. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to begin. Thank you very much for your attention. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our speaker and audience around the world. My name is Saran Yulam Lak. I am an international relations officer of NASTA. It's my great pleasure to be the MC of today, and it's our privilege to have you all. On behalf of NASTA, I would like to welcome you all to the international webinar on COVID-19, which is one of many sessions embedded in the NASTA annual conference 2022 or NAC 2022. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to those of you from a great distance to be here this afternoon. I'm really glad to see you here and indeed appreciate the time and effort you have in ways to join us. During this webinar, if you have a question, please do not hesitate to leave your question in the chat box by clicking the Q&A button. However, if we cannot answer your question in time or we are run out of time, our speaker will answer your questions by email. We will begin this session with an official address from NASDAQ. It's my great pleasure to invite Professor Pasit Palitaponkampin, Executive Vice President of National Science and Technology Development Agency, to deliver an opening remark. Please, Professor. Uh, Dr. Josh Fugao. Dr. Ernesto Oviedo Horta, Dr. Prasad Hirvarakun, Dr. Anand Jongke Watana, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on the behalf of the National Science and Technology Development Agency, it is my honor and most privilege to welcome all of you to the international webinar on COVID-19. This is one of the highlights of the NASTA Annual Conference 2022. I would like to express my appreciation to our keynote speakers for devoting their time to enrich this webinar with their knowledge and experience relevant to the global situation of COVID-19. And for the next generation of vaccine and treatment. Since SARS-CoV-2 was first identified uh, in December 2019 or January 2020, the world has already been attacked by several waves of the virus. Several millions of lives were lost, and the current pandemic of the Omicron strain causes hundreds of thousands of new infections every day with the potential to cause suffering from the symptoms of long COVID. While we have advanced our knowledge, medicine and vaccine against the virus with an unprecedented speed in the last two years, more progresses to cope the rapid mutations of the virus are still urgently needed. We are so fortunate that today we are able to organize a webinar given by the people who have innovated our tools to learn about and to fight against the viruses. I'm very thankful for the speakers for kindly spend your precious time with us. The speakers today include world-renowned scientists, Dr. Peter Kulis, the pioneer of lipid nanoparticle technology for the delivery of Messenger and a vaccine and a recipient of the Prince Mahidon Award this year. Dr. Josh Fukao, the world's most foremost virologist, the director of the China CDC, who oversees the control of infectious diseases and the outbreaks in China. Dr. Josh Fukao is a close friend to NASA and I'm really personally thankful, thank him for, for joining us. Dr. Ernesto Oviedo Horta, a leading researcher at the Regeneron, who was involved in the development and production of monoclonal antibodies to treat COVID-19. And Dr. Anand Jongke Watana, a Thai senior virologist and director of the Health Innovation and Management Research Group, 
at the National Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology of NASDA. And lastly, I, the session will be chaired by Dr. Pasar Uwarakun, Deputy Dean for Research, Faculty of Medicine, Silila Hospital, Mahidon University, and the Vice President of the Virology Association of Thailand. And he's also an outstanding scientist of the year 2010. This webinar give us an opportunity to learn, share, and discuss the current status for improvement and alternative solution to cope with this continuing global pandemic. I would like to thank all participants for attending this webinar and we'll be looking forward to hearing the material that be the speaker prepare for us and I wish this webinar a great success. May I also assure you that it is a time to start our conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Pasit, for your warm remark. Next, we have the honor to welcome Professor Dr. Pasit Uyawaragun, Deputy Dean of Research, Faculty of Medicine, Sirat Hospitals, Mahidon University. To be your chair for the following session, the floor is your Professor. Professor, we cannot hear you. Could you please uh, sign up and reconnect it once again? Uh, folks, we are sorry for the technical problem. Uh, we will start from the first presentation from Dr. Peter Coolidge. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to give this talk. Um, the, it's a great pleasure to uh, be part of this uh, this conference. Um, so today, I'm just going to uh, <clears throat> go through some of the um, some of the uh, background to the um, to the development of the COVID-19 vaccine that we were involved in. And so, the title of my talk uh, is uh, "Design of Living Nanoparticles for the COVID-19 mRNA Vaccines." Uh, but an alternative title could well be "Lipid Nanoparticles uh, That Enable Gene Therapies." I do have some conflicts of interest, as indicated on the bottom here. I've started started a number of companies. Right now, I'm the co-founder and chairman of Nanovation Therapeutics. Um, <clears throat> you've probably seen uh, in the um, popular literature uh, that the vaccine uh, titles such as "The Vaccine Revolution is Coming Inside Tiny Bubbles of Fat," and uh, <clears throat> many people will say that the mRNA vaccines are developed in these are, are delivered in these little fat bubbles uh, but uh, probably you haven't seen much more detail than that uh, this is a Bloomberg uh, explanation of the mRNA vaccines so really what are these tiny bubbles of fats and that's, that's basically what I'm going to be talking about uh, today uh, they're certainly really tiny um, they're 100 nanometers uh, <clears throat> in diameter or smaller uh, but they're really not bubbles of fat, at least not fat as you normally think of it. Think about it. Uh, they're really quite sophisticated uh, particles that are made of membrane lipids. And this is a story that began uh, more than 40 years ago. And so this is going back, right back to the beginning of my involvement uh, with lipids. Uh, the, uh, I, got, I got my PhD in physics in 1972, and I really uh, decided I had to do something different. Uh, the, uh, it seemed to me that the most interesting problems um, that uh, I could uh, I could see were outside the field of physics, and I was interested. I got interested in biological membranes. 
And so what do you learn as a physicist? Uh, you learn a number of things, but one of the basic things is to uh, go after very basic problems. And um, <clears throat> I arrived in Oxford as a uh, postdoc in uh, 19, I guess it was 1973. And um, the basic problems then uh, <clears throat> were, uh, were quite, quite simple. This is a model of a biological membrane here. Uh, it's still uh, the, um, uh, you know, a very, uh, <clears throat> the Singer-Nicholson model is this term, the mosaic model. Um, <clears throat> but the basic problems then are actually still are quite basic problems now. Uh, the, um, they contain, membranes contain hundreds of different species of lipids. And so there's a, there's a, a very basic question, why are they all there and what are they doing? Uh, and then the, the next problem is the, these uh, membranes have different lipid compositions, biological membranes have different lipid compositions on one side as compared to the other. This is called lipid asymmetry. And uh, so how is that uh, lipid asymmetry uh, generated and maintained? And I'm just putting this in because it was these very basic problems uh, that we worked on uh, that really in the end led to the, um, to the applications for the vaccines. And so one of the things I got interested in was that so membranes contain lots of lipids that don't adopt bilayer structures in isolation. In other words, they don't necessarily support this bilayer structure. So why are they there and why do they adopt those structures? Uh, another question uh, concerning can we generate, of course, biological membranes have ion gradients across them, sodium, potassium, and protons. And uh, so we asked the question, can lipid asymmetry be generated in response to ion gradients and what are the consequences? So, <clears throat> The, uh, I'm not going to talk much about lipid polymorphism, although that did come into it. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> the, um, but what I am going to mention is that uh, we used the unilamellar vesicles. We, could, we found we could make these, um, these small unilamellar systems uh, <clears throat> with a lipid bilayer, uh, and um, we used them to generate lipid asymmetry. Uh, this was way back in about 1990 or so. Um, using what we termed as an ionizable cationic lipid. And this has great relevance to the, um, to the vaccines, as I'll point out. Uh, the, uh, these, the, the, these lipids have the property that at low pH, they're protonated and therefore positively charged. And so this uh, tertiary amine uh, goes from being a, pos a positively charged low pH to a neutral form at a physiological pH. Well, it turns out that you can use these ionizable lipids to drive lipid asymmetry because if, the, uh, <clears throat> if the, the, the surface with the lower pH uh, will, um, <clears throat> the, the, these ionizable lipids will move across the membrane in the neutral form very readily, but get protein and positively charged, and then they can't move out again. Uh, lipid, lipid bilayers are very impermeable to charged molecules. And so you can generate lipid asymmetry is by including a small amount, uh, 5, 10 mole percent of the, uh, of the ionizable lipids. So this was a, a basic study that we did, but as I'll point out, it was very useful in terms of some of our subsequent work on, uh, <clears throat> on the vaccine and also lipid nanoparticles for enabling gene therapies generally. So I'm going to go through now in this series of, uh, of sections uh, the, um, how it is that we, these lipid nanoparticles that we generated uh, can enable gene therapies, including uh, the, um, the COVID-19 vaccines. So first of all, let's discuss a little bit about packaging nucleic acid polymers, I mean, that's this small interfering RNA, messenger RNA, into lipid nanoparticles. This is work that's still ongoing uh, in, uh, in my lab and, and others. Uh, the, uh, as we get more, more sophisticated ways of doing this. I'll talk a bit about the um, on Patro story, which we were involved in uh, from uh, 2005 to 2012, and this is developing a drug to treat a condition called transthyretin induced amyloidosis. And then I'll talk a bit about the uh, vaccine applications. So the challenge that we had in uh, 1995 was to develop a uh, <clears throat> delivery system that takes nucleic acid-based drugs to the liver and enables intracellular delivery uh, into hepatocytes. And so we had, first of all, package the nucleic acid in the lipid nanoparticle and then inject that intravenously, uh, and have it go out, circulate around in the circulation, arrive in the liver, uh, extravasate in the liver, get taken up by hepatocytes, uh, and by endocytosis, and then break out of the endosome uh, before it goes on to the lysosome. 
uh, and release the contents to the interior of the cell. So this is quite a challenge. Um, the, um, and certainly, you know, nature, nature really doesn't want nucleic acids to get into cells, and so there's lots of uh, barriers here. The immune system is certainly set up uh, to avoid this, this, this situation. Well, the first problem that we had was that in order to get efficient encapsulation of, a ne of the negatively charged nucleic acid polymer uh, into a lipid nanoparticle, we had to use uh, cationic or positively charged lipids. As is indicated here, you can see how you can get a hydrophobic uh, entity that you could perhaps package in a lipid nanoparticle uh, if you use these positively charged lipids. Now, there's no cationic lipids. There's no positive, permanently positively charged lipids in nature. Uh, they're really toxic molecules. There's only net neutral or negatively charged lipids. And so the, um, we couldn't use permanently at least the, the, the positively charged lipids because they're just way too toxic. So how could we encapsulate uh, the, um, <clears throat> the nucleic acid polymers such as sRNA or mRNA? So what we did was we used uh, the ionizable cation lipid we made for our lipid asymmetry studies. And what we found was that we could use these lipids at, say, low pH, where they're positively charged. We could load nucleic acid uh, polymers into them at, uh, at pH 4. That's about the acidity of a lemon, so it's not really that acid. And the uh, contents were retained uh, when we raised the pH to uh, physiological pH values. And these turned out, to be, because they weren't positively charged at uh, physiological pH values, they're much less toxic. And uh, it also turned out, as I'll point out, uh, to um, have important properties for intracellular delivery. So this is the first ionized cationic lipid that we use called DODAP, as I've already indicated. And it has this property that it's positively charged at, say, pH, pH 4, but so net neutral at physiological uh, pH values. What we found was that we could formulate uh, nucleic acid polymers, sRNA, mRNA, uh, into um, <clears throat> these lipid nanoparticles containing this ionized lipid using a rapid mixing procedure. And so in this procedure, we just dissolve all of the lipids that we, we have in addition to the ionized lipid, which is indicated in green here. Uh, we have some cholesterol, some, a PEG lipid, some a structural lipid, little choline, for example, dissolve them all in ethanol. And then very rapidly mix them with water at pH 4 that contained uh, the, um, in this case, an siRNA, the oligonucleotide. One of the first things to fall out of solution is this hydrophobic entity um, indicated here, the positively charged lipids associated with negatively charged on the negatively charged uh, nucleic acid polymer. And if we do this fast enough, obviously if we do it slowly, then it's all going to aggregate and we end up with a big blob. Um, but so if you do it fast enough, then the other lipids will fall out of solution as well as the polarity increases uh, as we're mixing the ethanol in the water. And we can encapsulate these things in a uh, limit size, as we term it, the vesicle, a very small vesicle. And the size of this vesicle is determined by the ratio of the surface lipid to the core lipid. And so we can get 90% uh, encapsulation efficiencies and the nucleic acid is retained at uh, pH 7.4. And so they're really a new class of lipid nanoparticles, and not, but they're not, don't have a bilayer structure. They have a hydrophobic core. This is a cryo TEM, and this is a 100 nanometer bar here. And they're really ideally suited to encapsulation of, uh, of these uh, of nucleic acids, including uh, sRNA, mRNA, plasmids, et cetera. They're stable monodispersed. We can adjust the, the, the size, relatively non-toxic. And uh, the, uh, the, the techniques for, for getting large quantities are really uh, rel relatively straightforward. So <clears throat> now we've got the packaging uh, underway. Do they actually work? Uh, is, is there, is there um, do we see uh, uh, physiological effects using these, uh, using these types of systems? So now I'm going to detail some work uh, that we did uh, between in the, in the 2000s to develop uh, the HATTR drug. So our, our objective in this period was to develop the nanoparticle systems containing sRNA uh, to silence genes in the uh, liver um, and the hepatocytes following IV administration. And, and as you can see, there's many diseases that we can treat by silencing or expressing or editing genes in the liver. 
uh, ranging from blood clotting disorders uh, to metabolic disorders, um, <clears throat> cancer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we started with a question, uh, can these, uh, these, these lipid nanoparticles containing sRNA to silence a particular target gene um, <clears throat> the, um, the, uh, and also ionized lipids? Can they, do, can they do this following an intravenous uh, injection? And what we did was we assessed the potency of these um, of these lipid nanoparticle systems um, <clears throat> using a, uh, a what we termed the factor seven model. Now factor seven is a clotting protein that's made in the uh, in the in hepatocytes. Um, <clears throat> it's obviously then uh, secreted into the circulation. And so by measuring the levels of factor seven in the circulation, we can determine how well uh, we're silencing that gene in the liver. So we injected the lipid nanoparticles containing sRNA to silence factor seven via the tail vein, and then subsequently assaying for the levels of factor seven in the blood. And so this was uh, done at 24 hours. We terminate the mice and then ask, uh, assay for uh, factor seven, and we have lipid composition where uh, it's all the lipids that I indicated in that uh, slide indicating how we made these systems. Uh, in fixed ratio, in fixed ratio, ratios, what we found was that the potency of these um, lipid nanoparticle systems, their ability to silence factor seven in the liver, was very sensitive to the species of the ionized lipid that we employed, and so we <clears throat> synthesized over um, <clears throat> over 300 different uh, ionized lipids. Uh, the ranging the structures that look like this are all tertiary amines. As you can see, they're relatively similar structures, but they can have dramatically different um, <clears throat> gene silencing capabilities. And so the, uh, it was a remarkable dependence uh, on the uh, what's termed the pKa, uh, the uh, <clears throat> the um, pH at which uh, these uh, these lipids uh, become positively charged. And what we found was that the pKa of around about 6.4 uh, we would see, we saw, and we saw remarkable increases in potency. Now, the the potency here we're defining as one over the effective dose where we can silence 50% uh, of the uh, of factor seven. And so, <clears throat> this is um, the dose of sRNA that's required to get uh, the ED50. Is the dose of sRNA that is required to get 50% gene silencing using the factor seven model. I'd point out that the y-axis here is a log plot, and so the um, you know if we move as little as well, the pKa for lipids that have a pKa as little as say 0.5 units uh, away from this uh, this optimum, uh, we can have a hundredfold decrease in the potency. So it was it's a really a very very uh, select uh, group of uh, of uh, ionized lipids uh, that uh, have remarkable potency uh, for um, <clears throat> for essentially allowing uh, the sRNA to get to the interior of the cell. And this is really breaking out of the endosome. And so this is just indicating the progress that we made during that time, moving from a dose level of, of, of say, 10 milligrams of sRNA in order to get 50% gene silencing of the uh, factor seven, uh, down to uh, five micrograms of sRNA uh, <clears throat> with the optimized ionizable lipids. And this was a lipid called MC3. Um, <clears throat> this was uh, this this is the progress that we made uh, during this period of uh, 2005 to 2012. So once we got to that point, I, I should say that the toxicity of these systems, if anything, decreased, and so uh, we had a very large therapeutic window of about a thousand. So in other words, we could go to a thousand times higher dose uh, before we would see toxic effects due to the carrier. Now, the, uh, we were working with a company in Boston called Al Nylon uh, on this. Uh, they're, they're a company that um, uh, is using sRNA uh, as a therapeutic. And the disease that their physicians chose to, to, to treat, and this is around about 2012, is a disorder called hereditary amyloid transthyretin induced amyloidosis. So, transthyretin is a, it's a tetrameric protein, it's made in the liver. Um, it transports uh, ret it's, <clears throat> the retinal binding protein, but it ha and it's it's a it's a large protein, um, and for quite a few mutations in this uh, gene, uh, the, um, <clears throat> the 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 tetramer that is the um, the the, the, <clears throat> the conformation that uh, is the active form uh, can can form these fibrils which would deposit 
it everywhere in the body. And so uh, if for, for and this, this, can, this has really nasty effects in say, nervous tissue and, uh, and heart tissue. So neuropathies and cardiotoxicities, there's really no effective uh, therapy and it's usually fatal within five years of diagnosis. And so this was the disorder, it's a hereditary disorder uh, that uh, is due to mutations in the transthyretin gene. It affects about 50,000 people worldwide. A very nasty disorder is indicated here. Uh, this is various stages of the disease. And you can imagine uh, an individual, one of the first signs is in your 30s, um, having difficulty walking. Uh, and uh, the, you can imagine somebody um, who is sensing that they're, they, are, they, are, <clears throat> they have these problems. They probably are relatives because this is a hereditary disease who have gone through this and they know more or less what they're in for. And it's not at all pleasant. Um, the, um, so the hypothesis here was, and this is the way that developing uh, drugs for gene therapies is, is, at least the concept is very straightforward. If we were to silence that gene, the transthyretin gene in the liver, then per using sRNA, uh, then uh, we'll re reduce the levels of the, uh, <clears throat> of the tetramers of the fibrils, amyloid fibrils. And perhaps uh, if we really reduce the levels in the liver, we'll actually uh, solubilize some of the plaques. So it's a potentially simple solution to what's really a devastating a disease, as you can see. So the clinical development program here uh, the, uh, for, for, this, for this drug uh, was in, uh, started in 2012. There was a, a study in healthy volunteers, uh, then moving to a uh, phase three study which was completed in August of 2017. Now, the phase one study in healthy volunteers uh, is indicated uh, here. The, um, the, uh, uh, this, is, this is just indicating that at a dose of a, a 0.15 mg per kg of uh, lipid nanoparticle uh, <clears throat> systems uh, containing the sRNA to silence transthyretin, there's a really dramatic decrease in the levels of transthyretin in the circulation. And so this is actually when goes on for about two, three weeks or so, or three or four weeks. And so on the basis of these results in the healthy volunteers, for the subsequent clinical trials, a dose of 0.3 mg of uh, sRNA per kilogram body weight was chosen, it was given every three weeks, was chosen uh, for the, um, for the uh, subsequent clinical trial. The, um, and so this is just uh, the, the details of the phase three study uh, that was uh, <clears throat> done on 225 patients. It was it done over an 18 month period, year and a half. Uh, and these patients were divided into 148 who uh, got the drug, it's called patacerin in the development stages here. And they, the dose level of 0.3 mg per kg, as I mentioned, every three weeks, or they got a placebo of sterile saline uh, 77 of them, and the primary endpoint here uh, was the uh, change in the neural impairment score uh, at uh, 18 months. There were secondary endpoints as, as indicated here, self-reported quality of life, um, the weakness, ability to walk, uh, body mass, it's a wasting disorder as you saw. So this was the study that was done, and uh, quite remarkably at 18 months, uh, if the, for people getting the placebo, the sterile saline, their neural impairment, neural impairment score got worse, as you can see here, uh, whereas the people uh, taking the, uh, the drug, the lipid nanoparticle containing SI, the silence transthyretin gene, if anything, got better over that period. And so here we, here we are actually making a hereditary disorder, uh, improving uh, the, um, the, uh, the symptoms. Uh, that these people have. And so going after the very, very basic uh, cause of a disease has have quite remarkable effects. And so the, um, the, uh, the, this, the, in September of 2017, uh, the res clinical trial results were reported and uh, they were absolutely spectacular. Uh, the, um, the neural impairment score, uh, the, the, this def the drug definitely works. Um, I always refer to this as one over Avogadro's number of the p-value here, but also for all the secondary endpoints, quality of life, ability to walk, um, <clears throat> nutritional status. So this, this drug is really a, a possibly a curative therapy for what was previously a 
fatal disease. So this is really, a, you know, a remarkable finding. Uh, this drug was approved by the FDA in August of 2018 for treatment of this disorder. It was the first FDA approval of an sRNA-based gene therapy drug uh, and indicated that uh, we could not only halt the progression of hereditary disease, but actually reverse the accumulated damage. And uh, so it really demonstrates the power of uh, gene therapy. I'm going to go on now to the uh, what's termed BNT162B2 story, which is the uh, COVID-19 vaccine. And so uh, <clears throat> this is where we asked the question, and this was with, with a company I co-founded called Acuitas, uh, does the lipid nanoparticle technology enable mRNA-based gene therapy? So here, instead of packaging sRNA, uh, packaging mes messenger RNA in the lipid nanoparticle, and then uh, seeing whether or not uh, it be delivered to the liver, um, get, <clears throat> taking the mRNA inside, and then perhaps we will get uh, the mRNA uh, to express uh, the gene that it's coding for. And so this, what we found was that the encapsulation process that we uh, developed works perfectly well for the mRNA as well as, the, as it did for the sRNA. And so this is a cartoon uh, really indicating uh, the um, <clears throat> the um, uh, sort, of, sort of structure uh, there. So the size is here about 50 or 60 nanometers in diameter. And uh, with the uh, MC3 lipid that we use for the on pat for the, um, the the product, the sRNA to silence um, the uh, transthyretin gene, what we found was that uh, yes, we could get uh, expression of the protein in the liver, as is indicated here. Uh, using the cyprase as a um, as a the gene that we were delivering using uh, mRNA, and uh, so this subsequent work has turned out that we can really use the liver as a bioreactor uh, to produce whatever protein uh, that we might uh, we might want, and so this is just indicated here for um, <coughs> of, of, of IgG. This is an antibody uh, that we're uh, with heavy and light chain that we're um, Coding for in the uh, in the hepatocytes, and you can get uh, you can get very high levels of circulating antibodies uh, resulting from this uh, from this administration. And so this is a uh, this by itself has huge um, huge therapeutic possibilities. Uh, but to this point, we got contacted uh, by Drew Weissman of the University of Pennsylvania, who's an immunologist, and uh, Drew uh, wanted a um, a uh, a system to to, uh, to to deliver not mRNA coding for a therapeutic protein, but uh, mRNA that codes for a viral a viral protein uh, to uh, see whether or not this would make a good vaccine. Uh, <clears throat> Drew had been working with uh, Catalina Carrico, and they, they they what they discovered was that by modifying mRNA, they could um, reduce the toxicity of the mRNA and increase gene expression. Uh, in vitro, but if, uh, in vivo, they have this problem of toxicity and inactivation. And uh, they managed to, uh, managed to overcome that using uh, using modified mRNA, but they still re required a uh, delivery approach. So the question was, we have a delivery problem. How do we get mRNA coding for a viral protein uh, into muscle and immune cells uh, in vivo? And so what they wanted was a delivery system to take uh, the mRNA coding for the viral protein uh, and either get that into an immune into a muscle cell and uh, get it expressed using the MHC1 uh, <coughs> processing machinery, or uh, <coughs> alternatively um, delivering to an antigen presenting cell in the lymph node for MH2 class responses. And so this was the um, so this material was supplied to them. One of the first one of the first objectives uh, was to um, to treat or have develop a vaccine uh, for Zika virus. Uh, the um, and so here, uh, this is the mRNA that's coding for uh, the uh, Zika virus premembrane envelope glycoprotein, uh, which is on the surface of the Zika virus. And so that this is developing this mRNA that we could then encapsulate. And this is, this work was published by Drew Weissman at all in uh, 2017. And the, uh, the finding here was that uh, this, this uh, vaccine provided total protection against Zika virus. 
Um, and so this was injected uh, in, intradermally in this case uh, with the uh, with the MR the lipid nanoparticle containing uh, the mRNA coding for uh, the um, the <clears throat> the viral protein, and then challenging uh, with the uh, Zika virus itself at two weeks or 20 weeks, and uh, there was uh, complete protection against uh, infection. Now, during this time, uh, the, this is in 2018, 2019, Acutis, as I mentioned, the, the, that uh, I co-founded that was developing uh, the lipid nanoparticle uh, containing mRNA, they began working with uh, Bio, BioNTech as a result of the success of the Zika virus and also influenza um, the vaccine uh, to develop an influenza vaccine. Now, BioNTech was also, this is a company in Germany, was also working uh, with Pfizer on an influenza vaccine. And so when the, um, the COVID-19 um, pandemic hit uh, in, uh, in January and February of 2020, all efforts, uh, instead of being focused on influenza, uh, switched uh, to uh, the um, switch to making a vaccine uh, for um, for COVID-19, um, and so this was this ended up using the uh, the lipid nanoparticle uh, that um, that we had developed with Acutis. And as you're all aware, uh, this was uh, very successful. This is a press release that was uh, <clears throat> that was. Uh, uh, released in, uh, in November of 2020, uh, efficacy of the uh, of the vaccine um, being, as I should mention here, uh, of course, that here, uh, where, where you, <clears throat> the mRNA is coding for the spike protein, the SARS-CoV-2 spike glycoprotein, and so it's the same system that we use for the Zika virus, uh, but now switched around uh, to contain the mRNA. Uh, anyway, so this is 95% uh, effective for preventing COVID-19. Um, uh, efficacy consistent across all age groups and ethnicities. Uh, pretty safe, very well tolerated. And uh, so th in the press release, they said, well, we're going to make up to 50 million doses in 2020 and 1.3 in 2021. I think they actually got up to 2.5 to 3 billion doses uh, by the end of 2021. Uh, as you're aware, uh, this uh, drug, is, this uh, vaccine has been approved in many uh, jurisdictions uh, now uh, around the world and is playing a major role in ending uh, the global um, COVID-19 vaccine. But they re really, these vaccine applications are the tip of the iceberg. Um, uh, the, uh, there are many other vaccines we're, we're going to see uh, with, using mRNA. Um, lipid nanoparticle mRNA uh, formulations, certainly universal flu vaccine looks possible. The HIV potential is uh, huge. Zika virus, as I mentioned, malaria and so on. But we're also going to see applications for, for, for chronic diseases ranging from cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's, and all of those are starting to become apparent uh, in, um, in the numerous startups uh, in this area. Uh, inherited diseases uh, are also, um, you know, the into focus here, so it's really revolutionizing uh, the, um, the range of, uh, of uh, drugs that we can we can treat using these gene therapy approaches, and so that's really the uh, <clears throat> the story uh, the, um, the, the, the I wanted to cover here, uh, how it is that we started from very basic concepts, uh, say lipid asymmetry, and then finding that was useful, the lipid was useful for packaging uh, these. Um, polymers into lipid nanoparticles. We could optimize these lipid nanoparticles. That was done using uh, the um, sRNA to silence, uh, to silence uh, transthyretin in the liver, and then uh, showing that uh, this not only could be used to deliver sRNA, but also mRNA, and then being, um, being uh, <clears throat> contacted by Drew Weissman to find out that this also worked very well as a vaccine. Uh, the, 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 there's literally hundreds, uh, probably closer to a thousand uh, people that have played a role here. Um, some, of, some of whom I've worked with for over 40 years, and this includes Nick Hope and Tom Madden, and many others I've worked with for 20 years or more. So we've had a very long-term effort going on uh, here in Vancouver uh, to, uh, <clears throat> to develop uh, these uh, nanoparticle systems. 
the collaboration with Al Nyland, which was pivotal, uh, the, um, and of course, the Drew Weissman University of Pennsylvania was also a major, a major, um, <clears throat> a major achievement. I should mention these things also work in the brain, so there's going to be huge, going to be some very interesting uh, applications there. So with that, I'll close and uh, just say that uh, you know it's been quite a journey uh, over the last um, well 40 years really, but certainly 25 years uh, since we first started working uh, with mosaic acid polymers, and um, it's now coming to uh, to a pretty interesting conclusion. Thank you. Okay, that's conclude our our first keynote speaker. Uh, I'm I'm very sorry for my earlier technical difficulty. Let let me in retrospect uh, uh, introduce Professor Kulis uh, briefly. Uh, Professor Dr. P Peter Kulis is the director of Life Science Institute and Nanomedicine Research Group at the University of British Columbia. Uh, he's a professor of biochemistry and biology and molecular biology there at the UBC. Uh, he's a uh, co-founder of so many companies that uh, work on the lipid nanotechnology, one of which is uh, the one that uh, uh, gave us the uh, COVID-19 vaccine. So uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Dr. Josh Fugao. He uh, sit on ma many important uh, positions in, Ch in China. He's the Director General of China CDC. He's the Vice President of National uh, National Science Foundation of China. He's the director of uh, China Academy of Science Key Laboratory on Pathogen Microbiology. He's also the dean of medical school of CIS. Uh, he's very, very well known in in our EID Emerging Infectious Disease Community. So, uh, Professor Gao, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to be here. Uh, so thank you for Dr. Wairoko to be the chair for this session. Um, uh, I'm very pleased to um, give a talk on the virus, vaccines, and uh, the control, especially try to address something in China. As you know, in China, we are still at least one of the countries running the zero COVID strategy. Of course, there are a lot of uh, challenges here and also a lot of spectacle issues here. But uh, in general, for the last three, uh, two, more than two years, um, so far, uh, zero COVID strategy works well for China. Uh, of course, you know, we have a big challenge at the moment. We have a big uh, outbreak in Jilin province and also in Shanghai. Everybody knows that. We are working very hard. Uh, because of that uh, strategy, uh, we save the time, we borrow the time, we have enough vaccine to be used to vaccinate um, our uh, public. I think uh, we also got some um, antiviral inhibitors here. So in general, so that still works. Now, start with the virus. As you know, uh, the outbreak was first notified in China as a pneumonia of unknown etiology. So from the very beginning, we don't know what it is. It's just the PUE, pneumonia of unknown etiology. But within a week, we isolated the virus, we did the sequencing, we know it's a new virus. With several groups, you could the group from China CDC. So this the paper was published in um, New England Journal of Medicine. So definitely that confirmed. You know, within a week, early uh, January 2020, it's a normal coronavirus. So after we discovered this virus, and the immediate scientific question would be, how and why did we get COVID-19? You know, is it um, by chance? Is it a, a rhino event? Uh, or is it a um, uh, black swan event? So that's very, very common question. I was asked for a long time, but now for almost uh, two and a half years. And, uh, you know, after we discovered the virus, me and my colleague Chen Wang with Peter Hobie and Frederick Hayden, one from Oxford, the one from um, US. So we uh, wrote something in January. On, in January. Uh, it's a novel coronavirus outbreak of global health concern. Because it's a coronavirus, there's a potential. It could cause very serious problem. So this is a, the, our understanding 
before the outbreak of the pandemic is here because coronavirus always could be a problem because you've got everywhere, every animal, they harbor the coronaviruses. You know, some virus, some birds flying in the sky, some animals running on the land and also human beings. We have so many coronavirus here. So think back in 2016, me and my colleagues, we wrote a review entitled Epidemiology, Genetic Recombination and Pathogenesis of Coronaviruses in Trends in Microbiology. There we claimed, you know, it is likely not a matter of if, but when the next recombinant coronavirus will emerge and cause another outbreak in the human population. So obviously, you know, we know we will have a coronavirus which might cause the outbreak, even the pandemic. So retrospectively, then think back, how many coronavirus would infect human beings? So far, we know we have seven human infected coronaviruses, including one very notorious, that's in 202 SARS. And then back to the 1960s, 1965, we, we had the first human coronavirus isolated, it's called HCOV 229E. So that's the first human infected coronavirus. Two years later, we have another one, it's called HCOV OAK 43. So after that, then we have the 202 SARS. And uh, two years later, after the SARS, you know, we have the Netherlands, they isolate the virus called HCOV AL63, Netherlands 63. You know, before the virus was, uh, you know, this time polit politicized this time, we always name the virus after the name, the country or, you know, the discoverer, the scientist or the place, you know, anything like Ebola whatsoever. And the same year, we have a cold call University one, HK1, HCO. So for the origins of ours, it's always a scientific question. And back to 1995, the HCO, HK1 was uh, sequenced in the 1995 sample in Brazil. So the in Brazil, they have some samples stored in the freezer, but they did when they did the sequencing from those old, so-called old samples, they found HK1 virus in their samples. Of course, you know, after that, we have MERS 2012 and 2019, we have COVID-19. As I said, now we have, we know two more coronaviruses from the human infections. One from Heidi, Heidi, and the other one from uh, Malaysia. So you, you, at least we know, I mean, if you, next, if tomorrow you have another coronavirus infecting human beings, it's not a surprise because everywhere you have so many coronavirus there. So what the origin of the virus? You know, from the very beginning, people tried, they thought it's from red bat, from pangolin, but you know, when you do the sequencing, those sequencing from any animals, they are different from the virus we have at the moment. Of course, the hypothesis or the theory is still, it's from bats and then through an intermediate host and then get into human beings. But at least until now, we haven't got any pieces of sequence or isolation of the virus from any animals. Um, unless after the human being infected, you have the virus get to infect animals, like you know, it's from a human being to the animals. We haven't found any um, COVID-19 virus. Actually, it's you know from animals to human beings. That's a scientific question. Need to be uh, closely watched for the future. You know, it's very, very important from the very beginning when we knew that it's a whole virus get and entered into your cell. So this is a good example from my group. You know, I like this uh, um, journal uh, cover. This is the Ample Journal. So they wrote, they, they, they designed such a cover, very beautiful cover. You know, pangolin virus, pangolin has an ACE2. The ACE2 binds so many uh, coronaviruses. At least they, those coronavirus can also bind to the uh, ACE2 from other animals, you know, I show you here. So this is the entry mechanism. We know, now we know the 
RBD, receptor binding domain of the SARS-CoV-2, they can bind so many different kind of uh, animal receptor ACE2. So after that, now we have so many variants, at least we have very of concern, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, um, Omicron. So this is to show you the uh, mutations. At least, you know, this is the uh, schematic picture of the ACE protein. You have a ACE with ACE1, NTD, RBD, L-terminal domain, receptor binding domain, and ACE2. You know, this is the ACE domain. Look at the mutations, alpha, beta, delta. They have less mutation, but when we get Omicron, Omicron, as you know, Omicron itself, uh, it has four sub variants. They have so many mutations in the receptor binding domain. So this is why people think with so many mutations, the Omicron virus might appear as early as in the early stage of the prototype appeared in Wuhan. Of course, again, this is a scientific question you need to be answered. So a lot of people working on that, the work you could in my group, you look at this surface for the mutation amino acid, you have so many amino acid mutated, and that will change the binding of the receptor, also change for the escape of a whole monoclonal, or monoclonal antibodies. At least one of the monoclonal antibodies developed in my group, uh, actually you know, produced by Eli Lilly, used in the US and uh, Europe, um, we call it uh, JS016, that one didn't work anymore. So with those mutations and the uh, monoclonal antibody that didn't work anymore. So we got the sequencing, and we got the uh, cryem structure and the crystal structure. We know how different, at least we know the problem of Omicron RBD. So Omicron RBD with so many mutations, the mutation itself helped to fix the up uh, confirmation or down confirmation with two ops, the receptor binding domain, or one up receptor binding domain, you know, help stabilize the uh, ACE protein. We, uh, we, we proposed this might help for the virus entry. Um, of course, you know, this is the paper me and my colleague we wrote at COVID 19 expands its territories from humans to animals. Because now we know we have so many animal hosts uh, that can be affected by the uh, SARS-CoV-2. So this is the, you know, the yellow circle here. This is the virus. They can already have naturally infected animals. And here you have experimentally infected animals. Obviously, so the SARS-CoV-2 have a very broad um, host range. So this is why the virus will stay with us. There's no chance virus can go. And it's again like the influenza virus. The influenza virus carried by the uh, flying migratory birds, they, you know, they disseminated to everywhere in the world. I think this virus, because so many hosts, they will stay with us and gradually they will change, they will evolve. You know, we will have some more and more variants. And one day we might have a, a recombinant um, subtypes. So this tells you. You know, from a prototype and down to the Omicron, it expands their host range. And um, we know at least alpha, beta, gamma, so many uh, options. We know the, um, the beta Omicron at least expand. You know, those animals with the prototypes, they, they were, they, they, those animals cannot be affected. But with Omicron, expand those and uh, only two less. And at least in the mouse, you know, it can affect the mouse very well. So that tells you through the evolution, through the adaptation, the virus expand its host range. Now, I want to see the, you know, the vaccines in the whole world. And the first line in China, we find an inactivated vaccine, adenovirus-based vaccine, vector vaccine, also protein subunit vaccine. So I want to remind you, so for the vaccine, believe the vaccine. The, va the, the vaccine helps us to eradicate it, the smallpox and also eradicate it, the uh, render pest. So vaccine did work, vaccine does work. So we got to work, work very hard to develop a vaccine to deliver the vaccination. So develop the vaccine, deliver the vaccination. If only the vaccine being vaccinated, the vaccine is meaningful. So 
This is why we still need to encourage people to be vaccinated. So overall, in the world, we have seven strategies or lines for the vaccine development. Inactivated vaccine, mainly in China, India, and live attenuated vaccine, so far, none of them been used in clinical. And uh, the protein subunit vaccine, we have Novavax, also ZF21, the one developed in my own group. And also we have viral vector, including influenza vector, this developed uh, in China, and also adenovirus, you know, AstraZeneca, also in China, adeno5 based. Then DNA vaccine, our mRNA vaccine. Of course, Dr. Kulis already, you know, talked a lot about mRNA vaccine and uh, ARMP nanoparticles. So that helps us very good, very well. So that's the, you know, I, li I like the last uh, sentence, the last slide that Dr. Kulis mentioned. So that really helps us to have a new future, new perspective for the technology. And the last one, virus-like particles. In general, we have, you know, those several strategies or line for the vaccine development. But you have the vaccine, and now the virus, we have so many variants. So this is why I call it the eternal Tom and Jerry story. You have Tom, you have Jerry. So Tom tried very hard, and Jerry is still there. Now we have a current challenge. The immunity after infection or after the vaccination, waning. We have a waning immunity. And also we have a breakthrough infections. At least at the moment, by all my sub variants, it's sub variant. So we try to do the booster vaccination. At least now we know the third booster vaccination is essential. And also we tried to understand the sequential vaccination program, i.e., by prime and boost, you skip the one vaccine, and the booster vaccine, the third injection, use another form of the vaccine. So that we don't have very well. So you, so far. In the whole world, we have 12 um, confirmed, you know, uh, uh, vaccine uh, for the being uh, used for the protein vac uh, vaccine, you know, from a lot of uh, companies. So one of them from my own group, developed the paper probably cell, we developed this uh, receptor by the domain, you know, S protein is a trimer, and uh, there you have a receptor by the domain. Uh, naturally, the receptor domain, they can be uh, linked by the disulfide bond. And then we move this disulfide bond, fuse them together. We confirmed from the very beginning, before the COVID, it works for MERS, it works for the COVID 19, works for SARS. At the moment, it works for the Delta and Omicron a chimeric vaccine. So this is what we probably sell. And this is called the ZF21 vaccine. So what we know, and this vaccine still works you know, for the different kind of the uh, variant, of course, with low, you know, it's really very low, um, like uh, one to uh, one to four times uh, uh, deduction of the neutralizing antibodies. What do we know? For the protein vaccine, you have an interval zero, one, two months, or zero, one, uh, four, or six months. We know the longer uh, interval time works better than the shorter time. So. This is why the program, immunization program, we prefer with this uh, protein vaccine, you know, get the longer interval for between the second and third jabs. And also we know uh, this one is, you know, prolonged, it works for, we confirm it works for the Omicron, you know, with this uh, one, two, and the six interval. Again, uh, for the United vaccines, we, we set up the animal experiments and uh, we know if the, the vaccine in the animal in mouse, if we have the two inactivated vaccine prime, and then if you have a third protein vaccine boost, you know, you get a very good, the red one, look at the red circle. It's the neutralizing titer. It's much higher than the three uh, injections with only inactivated vaccine. That tells you the uh, sequential immunization works better. The, that the animal data, this one tells you that published in Lancet Micro. You can go read that paper. And then two series papers from Cell Research last year to confirm it confirmed um, the sequential immunization works for two inactivated vaccine, prime boost, and then booster with the protein vaccine. You know, works, you know, 
look at the title much better. Um, you know, whenever I have a chance, I'm calling to share the vaccines. At the moment, at least we know from Hong Kong real world data. So if you have two or three jabs and uh, the, um, you've got a very good protection for the death cases and the seri seriousness um, the cases. So we should share the vaccine. If we do share, share the vaccine, the, the virus will share the world. This is the last slide I've called it for in terms of the vaccine. And uh, for the drugs and for the inhibitors, as I mentioned, you know, this is the first human molecular body developed by my group, of published in Nature, but you know, developed by Eli Lilly. It's called ATCV map. ATCV map was used very well in Europe and in Canada and the US. However, and then because this is a uh, antibody targeting the receptor binding mod module in the in the you know receptor binding domain. So because of the immune escape, this vaccine, this MM doesn't work for the Omicron. So we were calling for more broader neutralizing antibodies um, against um, SARS-CoV-2. And I guess we also have a you know non-competitive pair of homomolecular bodies. This one being developed as a bi-specific monoclonal antibodies. It works also for the you know the paper published size here you saw. Uh, it works in the um, non um, human uh, primate uh, models. And um, later, we developed this one as a bi specific um, human monoclonal antibodies. You know, we designed all of this bi specific with several contracts. You know, you, you can see from here this one, you have two uh, heavy chain together, a single chain here, and like this. And also, finally, what do we confirm? We confirm this BS uh, 15. This one works much better than the other. So this one uh, just published in Nature Immunology. If you have interest, you can go and read um, for you know the paper we published over there. Now, in addition to the antibodies, we are looking for some small molecules. As you know, Merck developed RDRP targeting um, small molecule codes. Uh, Monopirava, uh, you know, it worked very good at the moment, it will be approved to be used. And more importantly, Pfizer has developed an MPRO targeting, it's called the Paxlovid. So Paxlovid looks like it works very well, and in many countries being approved for the urgent use, including in China. So in China, Paxlovid was con uh, confirmed, approved to be used um for public for the public and in china lately last slide i want to remind you the chinese herbs so we know some of the chinese herbs from a very beginning it works but uh, you know but you don't know the mechanism so this is something we did um the paper published in bios by my group um in uh, last year so what we know we have these Chinese herbs, and then you have this streptomyces. This is called a simple, uh, symbiosis. You have the bacteria, anti, um, um, axinomyces, and you have the root of the of these uh, herbs. Um, and uh, because this metabolites from these microbes, um, they have this so-called leucoptin. The leucoptin being produced by metabolism of these uh, microbes and that absorbed into the uh, plant and then this plant can be used as Chinese herbs. And then we did all this experiment to do and read our paper for the MBIO. This is the uh, ecosystem for the you know, actinomyces plants um, uh, and metabolites. They form this uh, ecosystem to produce the effective uh, uh, inhibitors for the SARS-CoV-2. So this is one of the mechanisms why the, some of the TCAM herbs, traditional Chinese medical uh, herbs, they would work. So this is uh, my overview talk. Um, I think I will stop here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Gao. Um, I, I...
I think you said something very interesting. I would like to entertain one question. Uh, you said that the Omicron might be might exist from the beginning. Uh, could you uh, elaborate more? Because uh, do, 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 do you, did you mean that it's uh, somehow uh, separate introduction from animal, or it's just a precursor that start mutating a lot at the beginning? Because I mean, for for, for me, I think this is uh, both. If it's true, maybe a good news because if we would expect uh, that it would be less likely to have something unexpected like Omicron happen in the future because there would be limited precursor of something that would that mutate a lot. But if it is a mutation that occur uh, later in some immunocompromised host, like uh, a lot of people believe then we, do, we would expect to see more and more of these in the future. So what, what, uh, what's your, your idea on this? Yeah, Prasad, I think uh, this is a very good que scientific question. At least people think, at least there are three hypo hypo hypothetical you know, uh, rules maybe people think. First, like you said, immunocompromised patient, then they st speed up the evolution. And the second, maybe the reintroduction from the animals. That's, that's you know, uh, po that's the possibility. And um, uh, thirdly, it might be from the very beginning or in the middle of the pandemic, then the, the, the virus hit in some area, it, you know, under um, detected, and then, you know, suddenly they uh, appear. So at least three possibilities. We don't know, we don't know which one is correct. However, when you think about the evolution of the coronavirus in general, for the last two years, any new variants, any new vir viruses um, sometimes coming out, it always follow the general rule. Every month, you are talking about the mutation rate or nucleotide mutation about two, one to three nucleotides every month. So if you look at what happened with the Omicron, at least it's estimated more than two years, if it follows one to three nucleotide mutations. So from that sense, this is why one of the hypotheses, the virus might be there from the very beginning. Of course, I don't think we have any evidence yet that a very good scientific question to be answered to get a new, new scientist to work on it. Of course, and on the other hand, if you look at the mutations, they you know, clustered in the receptor by the domain. That, again, tells you because of the immune pressure. If you think of because of the immune pressure, that tells you it's something new. So that, there's a controversy here. I don't think we can get any conclusion. Um, let me wait and see, you know, say maybe one day we will figure out what happened here. At least what I want to say, we might have another variant hidden somewhere. At least now we know for even for the Omicron, we have four subvariants. In China at the moment, we have a sub Omicron subvariant BA.2 circulating in China with outbreak in Shanghai and Jilin. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So that probably means that we, uh, I mean, the world would probably need to uh, invest more on sequencing to see the precursor of the variants uh, that may come in the future so that we can detect it a little bit earlier. Uh, would you agree with that? Yes, do agree. You know, pre-warning, we need to form a kind of a pre-warning um, network or system for the whole world, uh, including the data sharing, um, uh, genomic sequencing, we should address for the whole world for the genomic, genomic sequencing cap cap capability for the whole world, not just in the developed country. Also for the low and the, um, middle income country. Thank you. Do okay. Agree. Thank you. I, yeah, I would really love to chat more, but we need we need to move to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Josh. Okay. If, uh, in, uh, for the next speaker, we have Dr. Ernesto Oviedo. Uh, he's uh, originally from Havana, uh, Cuba. He uh, moved to UK. Uh, uh, of his career, research career in Bristol, Surrey, and then he moved to uh, uh, pharmaceutical industry. He worked. He uh, worked with um, many pharmaceutical industry, and now he's the senior director 
of the medical affair of the region around. So, Professor uh, Ovido, please. Thank you. Good morning. Um, okay. So, I think I will request control. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, and thank you for the invitation to uh, to be here with you today. Um, it's my privilege to to share with you a summary of uh, the journey towards the development of monoclonal antibodies for uh, um, either preventing and also treating um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, infections. Um, Today, I'm going to give you just uh, not a very technical presentation, but one that will describe the, the rationale and also um, the, the most important products that are now in the clinic um, preventing and treating uh, COVID-19. Um, for uh, your, your background, I am a physician, a specialist in, in clinical immunology, uh, that have been working for more than 20 years in infectious diseases, mostly in, in the vaccines. So, oops. So, that is the, the main disclosure that I have is that I am a, a Regeneron Pharmaceuticals based in New York uh, employee and stakeholder. So, first of all, let's, let's go through the very basics of, um, of viral, vi the, the virus, uh, uh, you know, mechanism of infection and some of the immunological principles by which monoclonal antibodies uh, are being designed and, and used. As you know very well, and the other speakers have been mentioning, um, SARS-CoV-2 um, is an RNA virus that has as a main um, receptor for engagement with host cells, the spike protein. The spike protein binds to the angiotensin co converting enzyme to receptor in the surface of the host cells. And as you know, this uh, receptor plays a very important role in, for example, the negative regulation of the renin angiotensin system that regulates, you know, blood pressure in, in, in the host uh, system. And this receptor is, is very important to, to mention that is abundantly expressed in human cells, not only in the vasculature, but also in other tissues, for example, uh, in the intestine and um, in the endothelium uh, pertaining to other tissues, for example, the central nervous system. So what is, in, in, in a nutshell, what, what is the mechanism of infection? The virus, as you can see here highlighted in, in, in number one, um, recognizes through um, the RBD, the receptor binding domain, the ACE2 molecule on the surface of the cells. Once this happens, that triggers the internalization of the virus and the, you know, the, the, the release of the uh, RNA material that will immediately be entering in the process of uh, protein synthesis inside of the cells, uh, triggering two, two main paths. One of them is the replication system to amplify uh, this uh, genetic material, but also at the same time, the synthesis of proteins that will um, be the, the basis for the formation of new uh, viral particles that will then exit and uh, further infect all the cells in the surrounding and distant uh, tissues. Once these um, uh, particles are um, um, outside, they can, as I mentioned before, uh, gain access to uh, several tissues. And um, one of the most important ones, as you were very well, well known, is the respiratory system, um, and uh, which is the main, which has been the main system described <clears throat> apologies, for the spread uh, of the virus. So how the, the virus spreads, by, uh, it has been demonstrated that mainly by aerosol particles 
uh, less than five micrometers of, of diameter in the in the form of droplets, uh, either by direct contact or by uh, touching surface uh, uh, surfaces, you know, infected with uh, with the virus. So either direct contact through the droplets or by um, indirect contact via um, the virus contaminating several, uh, you know, uh, surfaces. The other very, very important uh, route, and that's why I was mentioning that the virus and the, the critical observation that the virus can um, infect other uh, systems, such as the gastrointestinal system, is via um, a fecal oral uh, transmission. This specific um, uh, route of uh, transmission uh, is now being taken more and more seriously in terms of, um, you know, uh, and we can talk about that later, uh, in terms of, you know, assessing the long shedding effects and the long spread uh, effect um, of the virus in, in, in the surroundings and the community. So, in terms of the disease, um, although we have discovered so far that uh, this classical path of disease progression can be modified and is observed in a different way by in different variants, there is a very common path uh, underlying the progression of the disease. First of all, um, uh, not because the patient uh, doesn't manifest any symptoms uh, cannot be infected, they can be asymptomatic patients that are infected with the virus that may progress to what we call mild disease. Uh, so this mild disease, we believe that is the one that dominates the, um, the, the clinical scenario and is the one um, that is present in the majority of the patients infected with the current uh, variants of the virus. So this mild disease is characterized by, um, and I, as I said before, it depends on the type of variant. Now we can see the difference um, in the in the initial um, uh, variants uh, by fever, cough, and uh, you know uh, the the typical uh, anosmia, and, and as, uh, you know loss of uh, taste and, and, and smell, uh, and in in some cases you know mild dyspnea. These uh, cases may provide may pro, uh, progress, sorry, to the moderate illness, which is more characterized by a, a more um, a clinically relevant disease, which can be manifested now by uh, radiological changes in the respiratory tract, and uh, also um, might also uh, imply uh, changes in the saturation system, oxygen system. In these patients, due to their re respiratory distress, uh, these patients uh, may progress, depending on many factors, to severe and critical illness, which uh, is characterized by the um, a, a, a more a deeper um, um, uh, defects uh, in the oxygenation, a more manifested respiratory uh, um, stress, and by this time. Um, the virus really plays um, a minimal role compared with the um, the inflammatory syndrome that takes over um, the the patient, in which pro-inflammatory cytokines are the ones that dominate the the clinical um, scenario, uh, taking the patient to uh, that could take the patient to respiratory failure, shock, multi-organ system failure, and, and death. So now, from the from the from the immunology perspective, just to very quickly remind you how the immune system deals with um, with uh, not only virus but bacterial infections as well. We have we are equipped with two main systems. One is the, the natural immunity uh, that we develop, and we and, and we have. Uh, constantly su surveilling uh, our our body, uh, and, and and the only one is the specific immunity that we develop to specific antigens that are the ones that protect us in the long run against um, any future infections. So, based on that on that principle, we have been able 
uh, two uh, characterize two main strategies for dealing with with these infections. Uh, what we call passive immunity, which is the immunity that uh, mostly um, mediates, you know, uh, is mediated by neutralization, optimization, and other non-specific, uh, uh, specific and non-specific mechanism that provides only temporary protection um, against the, the, the infection. This, this, this passive immunity usually doesn't have a, a memory, therefore uh, the lasting effect is not present uh, compared with what we call active immunity, which is the one that builds in a, in a very in, in, in a short or long term the characteristics that um, are that provide the immune system with the memory to be able to um, uh, deal with future uh, infections. Now, these two principles have been applied uh, technologically to the to the creation of the two main arms of products that are currently used for preventing and treating um, COVID-19. One of them are vaccines, as the previous speakers have been uh, mentioning, and the other ones are monoclonal antibodies. The main uh, differences are listed here. Um, while vaccines provide uh, both um, and mechanism, both products, sorry, uh, deal with um, the pathogens in, the, in a very specific ma manner. However, uh, as I mentioned before, immediate protection is only afforded by uh, monoclonal antibodies. They are preformed specific antibodies that can immediately uh, identify and trigger the immunological mechanism, mechanisms by which uh, the, 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 the body can deal with, with pathogens. That's not the case for vaccines. Vaccines uh, uh, need um, a certain time to be able to mature and provide the immunity, the long lasting immunity that, that is required. The other one is the, the mechanism of protection. The mechanism of protection for vaccines are mainly the stimulate the stimulation of our heat um, um, the specific cells in the immune system, while the mechanism of protection for the monoclonal antibodies is mainly neutralization, but also the um, functional mechanism that will trigger, uh, for example, optionization, complement fixation, that will eliminate cells infected with, with the virus. We call usually these mechanisms for vaccines endogenous mechanisms, while the one for uh, monoclonal antibodies exogenous mechanisms because they are already preformed and administered to um, the individuals. Oops. Okay, so there is something very important that we need to understand, and is uh, um, and I'm not I'm not going to be very. Uh, lengthy about this now because the, the previous speakers have been pointing this out already. Uh, and is the vulnerability of these uh, preformed antibodies to the capacity of the virus to mutate. And um, the basic mechanism, as, as was previously mentioned before, is the recognition of the monoclonal antibodies of the RBD uh, uh, protein on the surface of the virus and um, the capacity for neutralizing the binding with the ACE2 uh, receptor in the surface of the, of the host cells. Now, mutations, what happens is that they will decrease the binding of those effective preformed antibodies on the surface of the cells, and the more mutation we have, the less efficacious will um, the, the therapy uh, be. So, um, we have the theory from the very beginning of the of the pandemic that um, um, oh, several antibodies or compounds with more than one antibodies may be more efficacious in order to be able to decrease the chances for um, uh, um, for blocking the neutralization capacity of the virus due to mutation. Here, uh, I I I I am showing you the. Uh, very um, important summary of the products that uh, have been investigated and are, and are now currently used to uh, treat uh, SARS-CoV-2. I'm not going to mention 
uh, uh, the ones related to vaccines because it was already uh, mentioned. But um, I'm going to refer to the group of monoclonal antibodies. The two companies that uh, originally in the United States uh, received emergency use approval for, for the use in patients were uh, Eli Lilly with Valadivimab and later on Exivimab. And in, in uh, Lilly uh, received this uh, emergency use authorization in, um, in October uh, 2020, I believe. And uh, it was followed by our company, which received emergency use for the use of Cassididimab and Indevimab for the um, for the treatment of a mild to moderate disease, uh, COVID-19. Then it was followed by other companies, um, especially um, a joint venture between GSK and Deer for um, uh, uh, Sotrovimab, and most recently um, AstraZeneca. Uh, with uh, every shell. These uh, antibodies have uh, important differences in, the, in, 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 in their structure, and, but they all have um, the same mechanism of action, which is a neutralizing capacity to block infection of um, um, the, the viral particles to the, to the, to the host uh, cells. Or the therapies that have been uh, also assayed based on monoclonal anti sorry, on, um, antibodies are convalescent plasma, and um, antivirus as well as the, the previous speaker was uh, mentioned. So in addition to the ones that were in the previous slide, which are the ones now in clinical studies and in clinical practice, there are other uh, important developments and molecules that are coming uh, through the pipelines of different companies. The, the most, one of the most important ones I'm curious is, and, and I, I think it's a revolutionary approach to the way we uh, uh, manage um, uh, biologics to treat uh, viral infections uh, and other diseases is the one developed by a joint venture between Novartis Pharmaceuticals and Molecular Partners in Switzerland. This is a new type of biological um, that is not an antibody, is not a vaccine, is called DARPINS. Um, and I, I, I would really encourage you to uh, read more about it because it's becoming and will become one of the most important biologic tools and, and therapeutics in, in, in future. The other ones are three main, uh, either single or combination um, uh, uh, of, of monoclonal and, uh, antibodies um, that are coming down, down the pipeline very close to, to being approved either for emergency use or for BLA. Um, uh, one of the is uh, for, from cell, the comp company called Celtrium, uh, which is in late phase three trials. The other one is um, um, uh, from uh, Adagio, uh, very, very specific for the BA2 lineage of um, uh, SARS-CoV-2, and a combination of monoclonal antibodies developed by SAB Biotherapeutics. Um, also in late stages um, in, in, in the United States for assessment uh, uh, for the capacity against uh, SARS-CoV-2. This is the most important slide of my presentation and is uh, one of the last ones um, in which I give you a summary of the most important efforts so far of products that are being either, have been either been approved or are at very, very late stages of being approved for uh, preventing and treating um, uh, SARS-CoV-2. I just want you to concentrate first on the first um, column so that describe the different indications in which these monoclonal antibodies are being uh, used. The first one is for prevention in those patients that have not been even yet uh, in contact either with a host with uh, SARS-CoV-2, neither um, in an environment where the virus is prevalent, but patients in which we know that the, that is is very highly likely to be more susceptible to acquire the disease once they get in contact with the virus. The second one is post exposure prophylaxis, which are patients that are known to be in contact with either individuals infected or in environments where this virus is circulating. 
the other one, the third one, uh, is uh, patients in the community. And this is the larger uh, uh, percentage of the population, represent the larger percentage of the population. And the other ones, and is the most difficult uh, um, at the moment uh, for, for scientists and, and clinicians to treat are the inpatient or hospitalized uh, patients. So in the, in the four different uh, indications, you can see all the monoclonal antibodies that I was listing before, the different um, stages in which they are as of you know, last, last week. And even as of last week, there is a piece of information that was updated just yesterday that I can, I can, I can mention to you now. For, for, for pre-exposure prophylaxis or prevention, the most advanced uh, is um, the one from, uh, from a, the joint venture between GSK and, and VIR, so Trovimab, which just yesterday received, uh, in my understanding, the approval for, for use uh, in this uh, specific indication. The AstraZeneca products uh, is being already authorized for emergency use in patients of uh, more than 12 years of age. And uh, at the moment, uh, ReBio is conducting uh, clinical trials in China for their monoclonal antibody uh, combination, two monoclonal blocking monoclonal antibody combinations. Adagio, which was the other one that had a product for this indication, has been stopped because of um, a sensitivity to uh, being um, um, uh, affect, affected by the Omicron uh, variant. The post-exposure prophylaxis, which is a very large number of, uh, of patients and population, um, our company, Regeneron, Dili, and AstraZeneca um, have been the main players in this, in this area, but all of them uh, um, both our company, Regeneron, and also Eli Lilly, um, they um, uh, are affected by the Omicron variant. So uh, at the moment, not using this indication. And the AstraZeneca, if you shall uh, fail a phase three um, trial for demonstrating efficacy in um, this uh, post exposure prophylaxis. Adagio is also affected. Um, by the Omicron variant and therefore not moving forward with their efforts for post-exposure prophylaxis. In the outpatient uh, indication, we can see that um, um, uh, there are several companies um, um, you know, playing in, this, in these areas, almost all of them, and uh, the Omicron variant has really uh, played a very critical role in their in, you know, in, in getting these products out of the out of the, the market uh, under emergency use, you can see that our product in Regeneron is affected by it, Lily as well. Uh, there is a very high risk that the the the, the new um, bentolovimab from Eli Lily also could be um, uh, not available for for patients uh, under um, above twelve years of age. The EUA is at risk as well for GSK uh, in this indication. Um, the most uh, important uh, products in terms of monoclonal antibodies at phase three and late stages of development that are currently running are from AstraZeneca, Celtrum, and uh, uh, Brie Bio. Again, the monoclonal antibody uh, from Adagio has been stopped because of sensitivity to Omicron. And Novartis, um, and this is the, the new molecule that I was mentioning before, the, the DARPINs, has demonstrated a very significant positive uh, effect against even Omicron um, for, uh, um, uh, to treat outpatients uh, in, uh, infected with SARS-CoV-2. The inpatients, which are the hospitalized patients, is the most difficult ones in which none of the companies have really shown any uh, critical or important benefits. Our company, our company, demonstrated a 20% um, uh, effectiveness uh, through um, a very large trial uh, developed in the UK uh, uh, at phase three. Um, but they in, neither Eli Lee 
um, uh, nor uh, GSK um, uh, were able to show positive effects in the inpatient population. Other, other, uh, other efforts have been ongoing by the AstraZeneca uh, monoclonal antibody called Evushel, but the rest of the companies um, have failed, including the DARPINs, have failed in the hospitalized population. And mainly this is due to uh, what I was mentioning before, mentioning before, the complexity of the disease at that late stage uh, um, might not be just um, triggered or driven by the by the virus, but a, a mix with the the, the acute um, pro-inflammatory symptoms that dominates those late stages of the disease. And I'm going to refer to to the doses. Um, I mean, these slides can be uh, shared with you, but the most important thing as well is the the route of administration. You know, because of practicalities in, in terms of, of developing the products in humans, the, the usual initial uh, route of administration is intraven intravenous. But um, from the pr practical perspective, the, the subcutaneous uh, uh, routes and the intramuscular uh, route has been all, also uh, assessed. As you can see, most of them are in, uh, can be um, administered by intravenous uh, uh, root, but our product can be also uh, administered by, by subcutaneous administration, as well as the AstraZeneca in, intramuscular and the Adagio monoclonal uh, antibodies. Everybody's exploring how to use subcutaneous administration because of um, access uh, 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 advantages and also um, uh, the, 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 the capacity of administering more product in less complex environments compared with the uh, intravenous uh, route. And the last uh, sentence, he, uh, sorry, the last um, row here describes the sensitivity that I was mentioning to uh, currently to Omicron. Um, um, and uh, well, I, I'm not going to repeat what I was mentioning before. So in, in conclusion, uh, I just want to highlight that together with vaccines, monoclonal antibodies have played a critical role in uh, preventing and treating SARS-CoV-2. There is a very important piece that everybody's focusing, focusing right now, now that the population is highly immune through vaccination uh, and is the immunocompromised population. Immunocompromised population can be categorized and pri of primary and secondary um, immunocompromised. The most affected ones are the ones that uh, belong to the group that have genetic inherited disorders that prevents them to develop uh, immune responses against uh, 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 antigens provided by vaccines and in which the monoclonal antibodies are the only choice um, and the DARPINs as well to both prevent and treat um, um, uh, either in the short or long term, um, the infection uh, by the virus. And this is an area in which everybody is focusing their attention to develop uh, monoclonal antibodies. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vito. Uh, in, in the interest of time, and we have to go to the last speaker. We, we may come back to the Q&A session later, uh, if the time allows. So, our last speaker is Dr. Anand Jongkawatana. Uh, he's the director of the Health and Innovation uh, Research Group at the Biotech of the uh, National Science and Technology Development Agency. Uh, he has uh, developed quite a number of vaccine candidates, both for human and for veterinary use, and uh, currently developing um, COVID vaccine. So, uh, Dr. Anand, please. Hey, let me share the slide. Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for a nice introduction. I would like to, to thank the organizer for inviting me to be part of this COVID-19 webinar. It's an honor to be in the same forum as outstanding and quite accomplished scientists. Uh, today, my talk will focus on the viral vector platform that we have developed as a COVID-19 vaccine at NASA. 
these figures um, summarizes the technology that uh, scientists around the world have used to develop vaccines since the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we know a lot now about the mRNA vaccines, inactivated vaccines, uh, and, uh, a subunit vaccine. And the viral vector is actually among the most commonly used uh, platform. Uh, and we have heard uh, people talking about AstraZeneca, the kind I know, uh, Johnson and Johnson, Sputnik V, which are all viral vector derived vaccines. I put NASVAC here uh, to indicate that the vaccine that we have developed also falls into this category. At the beginning of the, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we hope uh, that vaccine would be able to control the spread of the disease by introducing what we call the herd immunity to the population. Uh, the way that vaccine can help is to prevent uh, the virus uh, or the contagion from, from passing uh, from passing the, hold on. Um, or passing the uh, the contagion or the, the, the virus to, um, to the immunized, and the immunized will block the, the passing to the susceptible. Uh, in other words, those who are vaccinated should not pass the virus to others. Unfortunately, the, this is not the case for, for the COVID-19. We now know that SARS-CoV-2 can be transmitted quite well among vaccinated population. And this data show that we cannot distinguish uh, the amount of viruses between vaccinated and unvaccinated people. So uh, from uh, we now know that uh, vaccine that we are using today uh, cannot protect us from, from uh, being infected by the virus, but it can only uh, protect us from the severe disease. So one of the one of the reasons why is that is the fact that our immune response induced by current COVID-19 vaccine are not actually enough for protecting us from virus infection at the, the upper respiratory tract or in the nose. The high viral replication in the nose will result in also viral repli uh, shedding as, as well. So one way is uh, to, to, do, to block this is to provide immunity at the, at the site of infection uh, via the intranasal vaccines and this picture shown here. And the most effective way to provide uh, the localized immunity is to use the viral vector technology. So uh, the viral vector platform actually has been the, in the hallmark of our research at the NASA Virology Lab for, for quite a long time. We have a long interest in, in developing viral vector technology, not only for vaccine research, but also for a basic science to answer a key scientific question. So here are a list of the, the viral vector that uh, we have uh, been developed so far, including uh, the auto-mixoviruses, paramyxoviruses, and rhabdoviruses. Uh, we have coronavirus, uh, retrovirus, and artery virus, and also the non-enveloped DNA virus, uh, such as the adeno-associated virus. I know the adenovirus and circoviruses. So this is uh, uh, actually the culminating of the research work that we have done for the past 10 years. So let me go into a more detail of how we designed NASVAC, which is the, the, the first vaccine that uh, people uh, at, at NASDAQ has developed for the COVID-19 vaccine. So basically, this is the human adenovirus 5 uh, that is engineered to carry the full-length uh, spike protein of the the folding spike gene of the SARS-CoV-2. And the gene that we design has been codon optimized for, for high expression in, in mammary cells. Uh, the sequence is also modified uh, to stabilize the protein so that the conformation uh, required for uh, fixed into the pre-fusion form not uh, change that easily to the post-fusion form. And we know that the pre-fusion form of the spike protein is actually the, the conformation that is uh, required for induction of the effective neutralizing antibody. 
And I also want to emphasize that uh, the NASWAC virus that we engineer in this world is very safe because we cut some key uh, protein out of the virus and the virus can infect a human cell for one t only one time and cause no disease or any clinical symptom in, in human host. But when NASVAC is administered uh, into uh, our bodies through the internasal vaccination or intermuscular uh, vaccination, we can do both. The viral particle can actually buy an intercells lining the in in uh, nasal cavity. And uh, once the virus gets inside in the cells, the virus will undergo replication, which in turn express uh, the SARS-CoV spike protein that we uh, we insert into the genome of the virus or include into the genome of the virus. And this spike protein then trigger the, the immune response, particularly the, the mucosal antibody or what we call the IgA that can uh, lie into the nasal cavity, which uh, we believe that this antibody will be a potent uh, neutralizing antibody that can block the entry of the virus to SARS-CoV-2 in the first place when the, uh, we get the virus through the, through the, the airborne or through the contact with, with the infected people. So we went, when we developed this vaccine and then we, we tested for, for safety and efficacy of the NASVAC in, in the so-called K18 or the uh, human trans, uh, ACE2 transgenic mice by doing uh, the, the classical prime boost vaccination and followed by the challenge with the, with the SARS-CoV-2 virus and we have been done in, in BSL-3 animal facilities. So af after the challenge, we monitored a lot of uh, parameters on in, in vaccinated mice, such as the weight and the behavior and the clinical size once uh, we sacrifice the animals, we look at the viremia, which is the, the viral titer in, in the blood, look at the, the titer of the virus in the lung, and also the presence of the viral in, in the tissues of, of the organ. We also get the, the blood of the animals to do the neutralizing antibody assay to check whether the vaccine can help protecting this animal from what what arms of the immunity, including both humoral and cell mediated immunity. So, in, in after we, uh, and, and you can see here that we also do both intermuscular, intermuscular, and also internasal, internasal in our, our regimen. So, this data show that uh, the mice immunized with the NASVAC uh, vaccine were actually completely protected from, from the, the lethal time for V2 challenges. I uh, can see that uh, the clinical size uh, five days post infection seem very, very normal, no clinical score at all. But uh, mice that immunized with the PBS control show severe uh, uh, clinical size after a four, four, four days to five days of the challenge. And uh, one sample here, the VLP, which is the, the subunit vaccine that we also developed in our lab. So only moderate uh, protection against uh, the challenge. So this uh, data suggests that the viral vector platform that we have developed developed is actually uh, performing uh, the, the best in, in our vaccine that we have developed in, in, in the past in the past year. So when we look at the clinical uh, other parameters, the clinical size correlated with the presence of the virus titer in different organs, such, such as the, in the nasal terminate or in the trachea or in the lung, we found that the virus titer in, in vaccinated mice were substantially uh, lower than in the control animals uh, in all in all tissues or in all sample that we tested. Uh, it's quite interesting that. Uh, both internasal and internasal and intermuscular and intermuscular double vaccination uh, performed quite well with, with NASVAC. Therefore, uh, our uh, study here suggests that both internasal and intermuscular can be used for, for our vaccine. But uh, the focus of our work is just to look at the inter, internasal. So, therefore, we just want to move on with the internasal to, uh, to get to get the, the data to support for using the international vaccine for, for clinical trial. 
So the immune response profile also correlated well with the vaccination status. Uh, interestingly, we, we found that a higher antibody response, uh, particularly the, the immune uh, neutralizing antibody, uh, are actually quite high in animals that are vaccinated internationally. However, the, the immune response of the T cell or the cellular immune response is actually more uh, obvious or clear in, in animals that are vaccinated uh, through the intermuscular route. Therefore, it uh, quite makes sense that because intermuscular we, uh, is actually the systemic uh, inoculation of the vaccine, therefore we should expect to see something of the the T cell response and the uh, humoral immune response uh, should be actually higher in, in the international. It's, it's uh, quite uh, anticipated. During the course of our project, uh, we found that the uh, uh, Delta variant occurred in Thailand and we uh, switched uh, our uh, NASVAC vaccine to become generation number two. So this, uh, we construct NASVAC number two, which replace the spike protein of the original Wuhan strain with that of, that of the uh, Delta variant. And then we had a chance to, to test uh, our second generation vaccine in the human uh, AC2 transgenic mice as well. And this data show that uh, when mice got vaccinated and challenged with the high titer of the Delta variant, we found that the all vaccinated mice show a good sign of clinical score. There is no body weight loss. However, the, the one with no with the TBS control show severely ill uh, clinical score and uh, the severe weight loss you can see here. Uh, we we still in the progress of doing all those uh, viral titer uh, de de determination. I I don't have the data today today, but uh, we look at the the tracheal IgA response in in the lung of the animal with uh, represent the mucosal immune response that we believe to be uh, one of the key factor we want international vaccine to boost. And we found that uh, the mice vaccinated with both uh, adenovirus Wuhan and I didn't know whether five delta or good uh, IgA neutralizing antibody in the lung, which actually uh, a good sign that our vaccine can can be used to, to induce a, a strong immune causal immune response. Although NetSwag uh, has a high potential as a COVID-19 vaccine, uh, we all know that the viral vector themselves have uh, some disadvantages. Uh, the clear, the clear extent. Uh, advantage disadvantage is that uh, the viral vector itself is the virus and the use of the, the repeated use of the same virus can lead to the pre-existing and, and uh, immunity against the vector itself and uh, that means uh, the, the antibody or uh, immunity that lays from the first vaccination can hamper the second dose vaccine which might result in the lower efficacy of the of the vaccine as a whole. So uh, we we realize that this is going to be a big problem if we stick to one particular uh, adenovirus vector or just one vector for the entire regimen of the vaccine. So to solve this issue, we we our group have constructed other vectors that can be used in combination such as the adenovirus 26 or adenovirus 35, which uh, uh, we know that from uh, other studies in other vaccines, such as those in Johnson & Johnson or Sputnik B, showing that the combination of the adenovirus vector, if used in combination, the efficacy vaccine will be much more superior than using uh, the, the single uh, vaccine at the same time. So uh, we have uh, we have made this as you know, 26 and 35 ready uh, so that we can upgrade our vaccine in the future. Another challenge is, is that we have encountered uh, a very rapid emerging uh, strain of the of SARS-CoV-2, and we now know that uh, the the variant that we are working is not Delta anymore. Uh, we are look, working with the Omicron. Uh, whether it's BA1 or BA1.1 or BA2. 
oh, uh, the cloning of the gene of the spike encoding uh, the BA1 and BA2 has been done in our lab. And now we have uh, at least adenovirus 26 and adenovirus 5 that harbor the gene that encoding the full length of the spike of the BA1 and BA2 ready for, for use if uh, we have a chance to, to test this uh, generation 3 vaccine in, in the future. Uh, the second uh, viral vector that I want to, to introduce today is, uh, is the one that we have developed in parallel to the adenovirus vector, so-called uh, influenza-based system. Since uh, we, we have a rationale that since influenza and COVID-19 are both respiratory disease, and we have, uh, in, therefore, we have engineered the uh, influenza virus to co-express the SARS-CoV-2 antigen, and uh, basically this idea, we can use this uh, viral vector as the so-called uh, bivalent vaccine that can protect uh, people from getting flu and COVID-19 at the same time. So this figure show how we uh, construct the, the, the vaccine, the flu-based vaccine in detail. Uh, basically, we insert uh, the SARS-CoV-2 antigen, and in this case, it is by RBD uh, from Wuhan, and also from Delta, also from Omicron, that uh, insert in, in the inacutinin in uh, space, which is segment four of the influenza virus. So now the, the this uh, RBD is co-expressed with the M2, which is another protein of the influenza virus, and we actually knock down the M2 in, in its original position so that we can further stabilize this particular segment so that our uh, gene that we incorporate into the genome of the influenza virus will be stabilized upon the uh, several passages in, in, in uh, the cell line. We transfer this passage into the cells and re recover this. Uh, virus out and propagate in the spatial cell that we have developed in the lab. This cell line has been uh, developed and so that we it can provide the hemagglutinin protein in tram. So we the virus itself cannot make hemagglutinin, but our cell can provide a uh, hemagglutinin to the virus so that the virus can be further expanded in in a small flask and also in in a large scale bioreactor. For this virus can can be used as another uh, international vaccine platform. So when the, when this flu based vaccine was tested in in the cells, we we show that a cell can be infected by by the flu based vaccine for only one time. It's called called a single round uh, infection, and as a result of this infection, we can detect high expression of the the RBD antigen in in, in those cell. Uh, you can see in green here. So when we studied the immunogenicity in mice uh, using both ININ and IM, IN and IM, we found a robust immune response, both the hemorrhoid and the cell mediated immune response. And uh, the one that made me made us very happy is that the international mice immunized mice secrete a good secretory IgA against SARS-CoV-2 spike RBD. And we also show that the uh, immunities in mice are also found to be, to put, uh, to be against both the COVID-19 uh, COVID uh, disease virus and also the influenza virus. So the, basically the idea of bivalent vaccine uh, has been proven uh, in animal uh, uh, immunized with this platform. Another key achievement in, is the development uh, of another but a vector uh, called measles vector based vaccine. This is a long time collaboration uh, between NASA and, and Professor Frederick Conti at the Pasteur Institute in Paris. And uh, the measles vector vaccine has been uh, tested and published in in a very good journal, Nature Communications, uh, this year. So this is uh, one of the one that we can pursue more. Uh, once the Dr. Palampo France, which is the first author here, uh, uh, come back from, from Paris and start uh, the work in at, at NASA. So the recombinant measles virus that, uh, that constructed in this study uh, could be 
done by inserting the, the following S uh, into a different position in the genome of the of the Schwartz strain of the measles virus. The Schwartz strain is uh, is a long has a long history of safety, and people use it for for vaccine for a long time. And they uh, actually introduce this plasmid into the cell helper cell and uh, can get the virus out uh, in in the system. And the the this platform is actually different from adenovirus and influ influenza that I mentioned earlier, because this virus can it's not a single uh, replication virus, but it can still undergo multiple rounds of replication once inside the body. Uh, because Schwartz cells, a Schwartz strain of measles has been shown to be very safe, and when the virus can replicate multiple rounds, so we ha it had more chance to provide uh, antigen to to more cells and can be long long lasting than a single uh, replicating virus in in an, with the other two platform. So we believe that. Uh, this uh, platform can induce a more robust immune response than a typical viral vector that we have developed in the, in the, in the past. And we show that the challenge test of the measles vaccine in hamsters also show very promising results. Uh, the viral titer in the lung, in particular, uh, is below the det det detection limit and, and also uh, we have not tested this vaccine for uh, internasal uh, route. Actually, therefore, the uh, nasal terminate, we can, they can still see the, some viral uh, what particle here, which is actually not uh, not quite surprising, because this is also intermuscular route. So we we believe that if we can do another route of of challenge study and compare this uh, intermuscular. In the injection with the internasal uh, administration into the animal, we could be able to see some, some result uh, in in terms of the viral titer in the nasal terminate. So far, this is also a very robust viral vector system that uh, in in Thailand will will be, be able to pursue in the future. But this is the slide. Just want to to show that we also have a strong collaboration with researcher at at Hosong University, uh, Agricultural University in Wuhan, China. Uh, our work could uh, lead to development of reverse genetic system uh, to generate swine coronavirus, such as PEDV and PDCoV. Uh, actually, our group uh, is actually the first one in in the world to to publish this with this early virginity of the porcine delta coronavirus and uh, uh, also the avian flavi virus called Dactimus virus. So this platform altogether will be uh, quite highly beneficial, given that more animal viruses can jump uh, from human to the host, and if in the future this uh, platform uh, can be ready for the viral vector research in Thailand. So this is uh, the last topic of my talk that our group at NASDA also have used uh, the reverse genetic system that we have ex uh, have strong experience with other coronavirus uh, to rescue the SARS-CoV-2 in vitro. So we, we have done this later than, than other group in the world, uh, not because we are doing slowly, but uh, we lack the in infrastructure, which is a BSL3 facility. But once BSL3 facility has been uh, constructed at NASDA, we uh, initiated this work and we can complete this work in just a few months after uh, we got the funding. So we constructed the full long uh, infectious clone of the, the alpha variant at that time. And we successfully rescued the virus out of this clone. We further uh, investigated how to make viruses uh, uh, out in, in our system easier by that than the, the system that people published by modifying the host cell line. And we further modify the infectious clone uh, by swapping the, the spike protein of the of the alpha variant to the delta variant. You can see here. We also uh, insert some foreign gene, which is the m red fluorescein protein here into the genome of the virus. So this virus can be recovered, and it showed that uh, the technology developed as NASDA facility 
can be useful for for future vaccine candidates, and we can use this infectious bone for for future vaccine development, such as uh, attenuated vaccine if we get a good spot for more further modifying the virus, and we can be able we uh, can be able to to modify the virus further to become an att attenuated virus. Or if people are interested in making the inactivated vaccine, uh, not using the VSL3 facility, we can can make this virus and become uh, inactivated further. And in Thailand, we can, uh, might have uh, inactivated uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, for use without uh, investing more on the facility that require VSL3 factory. So that's about it for my for my talk today. I like to acknowledge a lot of people who have made all this uh, work possible. A member at a, a VVCT lab uh, at Biotech and supporting staff at NASDA. Uh, we work closely with others outside NASDA, both in Thailand and, and overseas. And with that, uh, I thank you for your attention and I'd like to answer any questions that, that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nan. Actually, we are running over time, but if you bear with me for a few minutes, we can try to address the question in the Q&A box. Uh, uh, Dr. Nan, could, do, do you see the Q&A box or should I read it for you? So yeah. I, I will oh, start. Okay, okay fine. Okay, yeah. I will start with the, the e easier question for the LNP because the Dr. Kalis is not here. There's a question about the how L in, uh, lipid nanoparticle enters cells. So these lipid nanoparticles uh, are, in, uh, are taken up by cells by endocytosis. Once it gets into the, into the endosome, as uh, Professor uh, uh, Kulis showed you, uh, it ionizes because it's ionizable at low pH. So the endosome has low pH. It ionized and have positive charge, and then that make it fills to the membrane, and then uh, the content will will go into the cytoplasm. So that the easier question for me. So now, uh, more complex question for uh, Dr. Anand. Maybe uh, you can answer uh, the question about the safety of network, and maybe about the natural antibody whether it's better or uh, last longer or. Uh, than vaccine or vaccine okay. would be better. So I think the uh, next work, the question is the cell which contain DNA of spike protein integrated inside will continuous continuous continuously produce that protein. Uh, uh, actually, uh, NASWAC is a coronavirus, and uh, there is no evidence that at no virus you perform the integration of the genome into the host. Uh, I think it's a little bit. People confused about uh, adenovirus and and retrovirus, and uh, I don't think that the the DNA of the adenovirus can can be integrated into the host and do something that that cause something that we are concerned about. So in in terms of that, I I think it's very safe, and uh, we have used coronavirus for a lot of application before, and I have no concern about the, the safety of, of those those vaccines. And I think evidence of using AstraZeneca and Johnson and Johnson for millions of people uh, so far also proved that there is no uh, evidence of having integration of uh, viral genome in, in, into our body. So but for those I think this is my 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 shot on that is that gonna be no, no, no concern about that. At least there's no evidence so far about integration because the virus has no, no integrase, which is the enzyme uh, required for, for the integration. And the second question is a natural antibody VS vaccine, which one rests longer and show less risk side effect? Uh, you mean that the, uh, it, it, it's a question about the stability of, of the antibody? Or the vaccine itself. <laughs> what episode can you help me? I guess. I guess the question is uh, whether natural infection would give you long, uh, more long-lasting antibody less than the vaccine, see, see. or less uh, long-lasting uh, than vaccine. Something and like the, that. The data so far suggests that antibody for natural infection lasts longer, lasts longer, but uh, the the level of 
antibody from vaccine is higher. This is something that that I can I can feel it. If they have a long term monitoring of the uh, antibody of over a year for natural infection, they can still detect those antibody in those uh, convalescent uh, patient. But the level of antibody in those uh, in natural infected people vary quite a lot. For those asymptomatic patients, show very low uh, antibody response compared to the the patient who are actually having uh, severe infection from the uh, from the virus show higher response. So uh, from 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 that we can actually cannot uh, say for sure that those in fact naturally can can have a higher immune response than a vaccine. But for the vaccine, I think the profile is more uniform. Uh, you can see higher uh, in general the response from the vaccine is higher, but it's uh, less. Order. For about three, three months to three to five months, we can still we start seeing the waning of antibody from those vaccinated. Uh, especially if we vaccinated with inactivated vaccine, it went much sooner than, than mRNA and viral vector. Yeah. Okay, and then we have uh, one last question. Actually, the first question that was posed, uh, the question was: Is it possible to make a vaccine from antibody? I, I'm not too sure what what exactly is the question um, because we we cannot <laughs> use more antibody to do, to to do vaccine uh, to make vaccine we use antigen to make vaccine but uh, to modify this question a little bit uh, maybe if you think about uh, learning from the natural immune response uh, to to come up with a better vaccine because people are looking for um, broader protective vaccine to cover all the variants and that yeah, I think, we probably yeah. can learn from uh, human uh, natural response. So yeah. uh, Dr. Anand, or maybe uh, Dr. Oviedo, if you can it can uh, can join share your thought, uh, welcome. Okay. Anand, please. Yeah, I think I think uh, I agree that if we got some uh, knowledge about those epitopes from from the conversation and I think people are going to that to that end coronavirus thing. Uh, we instead of updating vaccine every every year, if we look at the knowledge from those recover from the COVID nineteen and get a good epitope of the of the antibody, we can actually focus on that particular epitope and make a pan coronavirus. So for for that uh, question, I think that might be able to make a COVID vaccine from antibody. Not the antibody itself, but what that antibody can tell us to to move on to to design specific vaccine for to cross protect actually the all the variant that are emerging today. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ovido. Uh, do we have anything to add? Because we are uh, at the end of the yeah. No, seminar. thank you so much for the invitation and. And, and also, I would like to highlight that any future efforts um, will really have to encompass new technologies as well and quite a lot of modeling. I mean, to predict the future, there's nothing more important than to learn from the past. And um, the modeling is something that will be a, a technology and a device that will really provide us with the most the, the closer clues to prevent uh, another outbreak another you know pandemic in the world and i know that there are organizations both academic and government organizations working on, on on this already not only for covid but also for other uh, very important infectious diseases thank you okay thank you so uh, with that, I would like to conclude our, our seminar here. Um, uh, I would like to thank all the speakers, also all the participants that uh, stay with us. Uh, I apologize again for uh, running over time, but I think we have a very good discussion. We had a very good discussion. So thank you very much, everyone. So uh, oh, Ajahn Prasit, uh, do you have anything uh, to add? So I will uh, uh, send back to, to MC and Ajahn Prasit then. Thank you. I just would like to thank all the speaker for the really interesting uh, talk. That is really useful and I hope that we will have a chance to see each other again. 
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Basit and Professor Persad. We are now coming to the final part of our webinar. I would like to thank you everyone once again for your time to participate in this webinar. It's been a pleasure to hold this event. Please be informed that you will receive the video clip of this webinar and booklet in your registered email tomorrow morning. Before you leave, please do not forget to do our survey. Thank you very much and have a nice day or have a nice evening. Thank you.